morning. Happy Monday. As always, if you have a question, uh, put it in the chat. I'll go through first uh, the due dates that we have coming up this week, things that you need to be working on, and then I will uh, go into the nervous system. We've got today's lecture and then a half lecture tomorrow on chapter seven, and then we're going to start um, chapter eight. We are, are almost done with this unit. We'll then have a test on the end two chapters here, chapter seven, chapter eight, um, and then your final will be cumulative. So let us start with Canvas. So looking at Canvas here, a few due dates I want to put your way again for this week. Um, you have got your homework five is due. Homework five is due Wednesday, April 15th. Um, homework five is due at class time. So it's due at 9.05, homework five, 9.05. It is the usual homework format. So it's 20 multiple choice questions and then uh, two short answers. Um, the other part due this week is a case studies. I want you to read about monkey brains and then type up your responses and submit that. So when you click on case study, Here's the PDF I want you to read, and then you're going to type your, up your answers and you're going to hit submit assignment for that one. And then um, you have a worksheet about your cranial nerves. We're going over cranial nerves today. Um, and those are the last assignments for the nervous system unit for the discussions. Again, each week you need to participate twice in a discussion. So we have a new things you found interesting or confusing for this week. And then we have got um, a new nervous system questions due on April 17th. So part three, nervous system questions. Um, and these questions are for that last unit. So again, talking about the peripheral nervous system and talking about some neurological diseases, which we'll cover on Wednesday. Okay. Are there any questions about what is due in the next week or two? There are only three of you, so you can actually unmute yourself and ask if you have questions. Awesome. We're gonna we're gonna jump to the PowerPoint here. Chat. So where we left off is we had finished up the central nervous system, and then we had moved into the peripheral nervous system. As a reminder, your central nervous system. This is your brain and your spinal cord. And then your peripheral nervous system are all the nerves in your body that come either out of your uh, cranial nerves, which we'll talk about, or your spinal nerves, which we discussed already. So again, you have spinal nerves, the nerves coming out of your spine, 31 pairs of them, and they're named for the region of your spine that the nerves exit from. So you have cervical, thoracic, lumbar, et cetera. Okay. So for this one, let's talk now about the cranial nerve. So the cranial nerves are... Um, you have 12 pairs of cranial nerves, and they um, serve the head and neck mainly. So these are coming out from the brain um, as opposed to out from the spinal cord, which is why we call them cranial nerves. And they're going to mainly serve the head and neck, but there are there's one that doesn't. So you have 12 pairs. The vagus nerve serves your thoracic and abdominal region, and we'll talk about that. Um, so you, with the cranial nerves, you need to know their name and their number, so which is cranial nerve one, what's cranial nerve two, what's cranial nerve three, and then you need to know what it does, so the function of that cranial nerve, and then finally, you need to know whether it is considered a motor nerve, a sensory nerve, or both. So uh, most of them are mixed, most, most of them are both sensory and motor, but a few are not, and we'll talk about that as we look through. So what this picture is showing here on the bottom is where the cranial nerves exit from the brain, um, starting with cranial nerve one, which is olfactory, to optic, ocular motor, and so on. So this is showing you what they target. So some of them are easy to figure out what the targets are, like olfactory, for example. Everyone, you should know that olfaction is, is the anatomy word for smelling. So the olfactory nerve targets your sense of smell. Optic targets sight. Um, but some of them are a little bit more confusing. So we'll go into that, you'll have you know, that cranial nerve worksheet that's due. Okay, so your olfactory one is the first one. These are going to come and they're going to synapse um, on your sense of smell, so in the olfactory bulb. 
Um, and the function here is this is purely sensory. This carries just our sense of smell. Um, and the way you test that is you have someone smell something. Can they smell? So can they, do they have a functioning olfactory? Two is optic. These come from the retina. These form our optic nerve, which sends all of our visual information back to our optic lobe, which we'll talk about in the next chapter. And this is also purely sensory. It's just vision. Three is ocular motor. So this runs from our brain into our eye and allows you to move four of the six muscles for your eye, that direct the eyeball and the eyelid. And it also controls lens shape and pupil size. And this will make more sense in the next chapter when we talk about the vision system and we go into what these different parts of, of the eye do. Four is our trochlear nerve from the midbrain also to the eye. And this is the other uh, external muscle for the eye, for movement of the eye. So when you test cranial nerve three, you're also testing cranial nerve four. Okay, cranial nerve five is our trigeminal nerve. This runs from our pons um, to different parts of your face and this conducts sensory input from the skin of the face um, and also as the motor input for chewing. You have six, the abductance muscle. This runs also from your brain to your eye and is the last uh, eye muscle that you're testing. Then you have, so again, you're gonna test that all together. When you have someone move their eye around, they're actually using a, a few different cranial nerves. Here. Cranial nerve seven is our facial nerve. This comes from the pons to our face, and this is for facial expression as well as our salivary glands, so the ability to create saliva. Um, and then the sensory impulses from the anterior part of our tongue and the taste buds that are on the anterior part of our tongue. And we'll talk about taste again in chapter eight, the next chapter. Uh, cranial nerve eight is our vestibular cochlear nerve. This is uh, from the inner ear to our brainstem. We'll talk about the role of cranial nerve eight in chapter eight when we talk about hearing and balance. This one is purely sensory, so it's just the sense of hearing and the sense of balance. No motor nerve component to this cranial nerve. We have cranial nerve nine or glossopharyngeal one and this comes from our medulla to the throat and it's going to supply the motor fibers to the throat and promote swallowing and saliva production um, and then the interesting one is cranial nerve 10 this is our vagus nerve and so what's interesting about the vagus nerve is that while the rest of them stay in the head and neck the vagus nerve will extend down and it will go to our thoracic and our abdominal cavity and the vagus nerve is involved with parasympathetic fibers. These promote digestion, help regulate heart rate. Um, if you've ever seen a scary thing and then you've passed out, usually that is, we call that an overreaction to your vagus nerve. So as we'll talk about in a little bit, you have this fight or flight reflex. Um, and so something scary is gonna, gonna turn on your sympathetic nervous system. And then your vagus nerve will turn on to kind of counteract that. And if it goes too far, out overactivation of the vagus nerve there okay cranial nerve 11 is our accessory nerve these go to the muscles of the neck um, and these are motor fibers that activate muscles in your neck and then you have your hypoglossal which is cranial nerve 12 and this goes to the other part of your tongue and has motor and sensory fibers so um, what we would have done in class is we would have created a mnemonic to help us remember the cranial nerve so if you're watching this video back I'm going to pause it, try and think of a mnemonic on your own. If you're watching it live, I'm going to give you guys a second to try and think of a mnemonic for your cranial nerve, um, keeping in mind the things that you need to know. So you need to know the name of the nerve with its number, and then what it does, and also what kind of fibers. Is it motor, is it sensory, or is it both? Okay, so thought of one. Here's, here's one if you have not. On old Olympus's towering top, a Finn and German viewed some hops. So this first cranial nerve mnemonic helps you remember the names of each of the nerves in order. So 1 through 12, on old Olympus's towering top, a Finn and German viewed some hops. And the second one is to help you remember if it's sensory fibers, motor fibers, or both. So S being sensory, M being motor, and B being both. So some say merry money, my brother says big brains matter more are important. That'll help you remember if it's sensory, if it's motor, or if it's both. Okay. Are there any questions people have about our cranial nerves? Okay, so let's 
talk about our spinal nerves now. So the cranial nerves are responsible mainly for uh, doing things for the head and the neck, except for the vagus nerve, again, which goes into the thoracic and abdominal cavities. Our spinal nerves innervate the body. So again, 31 pairs of spinal nerves named from where they arise in the spinal cord. They have dorsal and ventral components to them. And for your spinal nerves, these all have motor and sensory. So these are all both motor and sensory nerves. Um, and they form these plexuses, which are complex networks in the body that bring sensation, bring information to all parts of your body. Again, they're named for where they originate, cervical, thoracic, lumbar, and sacral nerves. So keep in mind, you have to know the order of the vertebrae in order to know the order that your spinal nerves go in. And with that, I'm not going to make you know the different plexuses, so um, we're going to keep moving forward. And we're now going to talk about the autonomic nervous system, so the, the motor branch of the peripheral nervous system. So we have, remember, if you look, think back to that original chart, the peripheral nervous system, the motor branch, these are the efferent pathways. So coming out of the brain and spinal cord, we have motor information, and there are two classifications. We have the somatic system, which is uh, the motor neurons that go directly to your skeletal muscle. Those are under our conscious control. We're saying squeeze your bicep, move your quadriceps, etc. We also have the autonomic nervous system, and the autonomic nervous system controls your body functions automatically. This system works with our autonomic processes, our involuntary processes. So think back to muscles, how we had two different types of muscles that were involuntary. We had our cardiac muscle, our heart, and our smooth muscle in our organs. So those two groups of muscles are involuntary. They work automatically here with the autonomic nervous system. The autonomic nervous system can also turn on or off certain glands, which we'll talk about. And the role of the autonomic nervous system is to try to keep our body processes at homeostasis, to keep us at a, a happy set point in terms of, of all of the things that our body controls, whether that is temperature, heart rate, blood sugar, all of that. And the autonomic nervous system will work to try and keep you in balance. Again, the somatic nervous system, motor, we're talking skeletal muscle here. So these are motor cell bodies in the central nervous system. They terminate on skeletal muscle and they use acetylcholine as their neurotransmitter. So the motor neuron in the somatic system is gonna release acetylcholine onto the skeletal muscle like we talked about in the skeletal muscle chapter. Uh, and that's gonna lead through that whole chain of events that leads to muscle contraction. The autonomic nervous system also uses motor neurons, but it's going to use a chain of two motor neurons. The first one we call the preganglionic motor neuron. This is in our central nervous system. So this is the ner nerve that's either in the brain or the spinal cord. And then you're going to have the synapse where it meets the second nerve outside the central nervous system. And the postganglionic neuron, or the second neuron, is going to terminate on the organ that's being affected, either the cardiac, the smooth muscle, or the gland. And we have two branches of the autonomic nervous system, our sympathetic nervous system, which is for our fight or flight response. So this is going to be anything that's going to get your body ready to engage in something um, that needs to have all those systems turned up and ramped up. Whereas your parasympathetic, we call that our rest and digest. So those are the, the buzzwords I want you to think about when you think about your sympathetic versus your parasympathetic. The autonomic nervous system also uses different neurotransmitters. So while the somatic system just uses acetylcholine, the autonomic nervous system uses acetylcholine, and it also uses two other neurotransmitters, norepinephrine and epinephrine. And you may be familiar with epinephrine, um, especially with the rise of, of food allergies and people using EpiPens or, or epinephrine shots or epinephrine auto-injectors. Um, and epinephrine is the um, neurotransmitter involved, especially with that fight or flight re reflex, that sympathetic nervous system. And so it, it does a whole bunch of processes that we're just about to talk about um, that gear your body up for a fight. And what happens when you're in anaphylaxis or with an allergic reaction is you can use epinephrine to turn on that fight or flight response and help you overcome the anaphylactic reaction or counteract that anaphylactic reaction. Okay, so this is what it, it looks like visually. Um, the somatic nervous system, again, going onto our skeletal muscles. We've got one motor neuron releasing acetylcholine onto a skeletal muscle. And our autonomic nervous system 
we have two different divisions, the sympathetic parasympathetic. They use two neurons, two neurons, and they're going to targets things like smooth muscles, glands, and cardiac muscles, and they use various neurotransmitters here, acetylcholine, norepinephrine, and epinephrine. So the somatic nervous system just uses one neurotransmitter, acetylcholine. Our autonomic nervous system uses three different neurotransmitters, acetylcholine, norepinephrine, or epinephrine, and the targets are different. So you want to keep in mind and be able to compare and contrast here the somatic versus the autonomic, which is what this question is asking. How do they compare? So you want to be able to do that effectively. Okay. So let's focus in on our sympathetic and our parasympathetic. So our parasympathetic is their rest and digest. These nerves come from our cranial sacral division. So these involve our cranial nerves as well as sacral or pelvic nerves, and they have a very short postganglionic axon. So the second neuron is very small. Whereas our sympathetic, this is our thoracic lumbar division. So they come from the middle part of your body and have a longer postganglionic axon. Picture here, the second one in our parasympathetic is very short. Whereas you can see here, our sympathetic, the second one is much longer. Okay. This is an, uh, map of the body showing where these neurons come out. So again, those parasympathetic shown in purple, these are coming from the cranial regions, so we've got cranial nerves, part of the parasympathetic, as well as the sacral nerves for the parasympathetic, and the sympathetic nerves are coming from the thoracolumbar region, so the middle of the spinal cord. And what you can see is that they have a lot of the same targets. So in your heart, for example, you're gonna have nerves that are saying, rest, rest and digest, relax, in the parasympathetic division. And in the heart, you're also gonna have those sympathetic nerves, things telling you to fight or flight, to get active and get ready. Um, and so a lot of the targets are gonna be the same, but what they're telling the organ to do is gonna be the opposite. And so you wanna think about what you would need your body to do to get ready for those two scenarios, either a fighting, fighting scenario or a resting, digesting scenario. So again, sympathetic, fight or flight, we're gonna increase our cardiac output and our respiration. So we're gonna use our body's energy to increase our heart rate, to increase the amount of oxygen that we're taking in for our lungs. And on the converse, we're gonna turn down those processes that we don't need at that moment. So if you're facing a bear, for example, you're hiking in the woods, you see a bear, you're going to need to increase your heart rate. You're gonna to need to increase the blood to your skeletal muscles so you can run really fast. You're going to need to increase the amount of oxygen your lungs are taking in. So again, you can run really fast. Um, and at that time, you don't need to worry about things like digestion or urination. And so you're going to decrease all of those non-essential processes. The parasympathetic is the opposite. So this is going to tell your organs, okay, we're in a time of resting and digesting. So slow the heart rate down. Let's relax. Let's spend more energy digesting our food and eating our food. Uh, the parasympathetic nervous system is responsible for that feeling you get after Thanksgiving dinner, where you're really full and you're subsequently really tired. It has nothing to do with the tryptophan and everything to do with your parasympathetic division of your nervous system telling your body it's time to eat food. And because it's time to eat food, it's time to slow your heart rate down, put the blood out of your skeletal muscles and fill your digestive tract with all that blood. And as a consequence, you, you get pretty sleepy. So you want to think about what body functions are associated with either resting and digesting that post Thanksgiving meal period or the sympathetic, the fight or flight, the I just saw a bear. So which one is going to have increased heart rate or increased urge to urinate, increased saliva, increased blood sugar, dilation of our bronchioles, dilation of blood in our skeletal muscles, sweat glands, activating and constricting your pupils. I want you to take a minute and try and think first to yourself um, which one would be associated with each of those two scenarios. So this is the giant chart. I'm not going to go through the whole chart, um, but you should know a few of the key ones, right? Like you should know, for example, what which happens to our heart. So in parasympathetic resting and digesting, we're going to have slow, steady heart rate. Whereas when we're fighting and fighting, we're going to have increased rate, increased force. Okay, same. Opposite is true here with digestion. In the resting and digesting, we're increasing the smooth muscle contractions of our digestive system. 
Whereas when we're fighting and fighting, we're turning that digestive system off. We're not spending energy. We're not spending time working on digesting our food. Okay. Um, and then there are certain target organs that are only targeted by our sympathetic nervous system. So for example, our liver doesn't have any parasympathetic uh, input, but the sympathetic nervous system will tell the liver to release glucose into the bloodstream. So the liver stores glucose polymers and when you need it, it can release it into the bloodstream. And so when you're in a fight or flight situation, you're gonna need a lot of energy to run, to fight, to escape the giant bear. So sympathetic system will tell your liver, okay, release that glucose, no parasympathetic effect. So you wanna pay attention to some of the key organs and some of the differences um, that are important between the two systems. I'm just going through more of them, right? The sympathetic, the parasympathetic is gonna constrict your pupils, whereas the sympathetic is gonna dilate the pupils. And we'll talk in chapter eight about what the pupils do and, and how that regulates light. Again, no effect for a lot of these of the parasympathetic, just with the sympathetic telling your body to release certain hormones, to start sweating, to make, make goosebumps, to break down some adipose tissue, break down some fat. Again, you're gonna need that energy. Um, and you wanna think, again, parasympathetic, Resting and digesting, how I feel after Thanksgiving. Sympathetic, fighting and flighting, how I would feel facing a giant bear. Okay. So with that, we have reached the end of this unit um, that we're going to cover today. And on Wednesday, we'll finish out Chapter 7. If you guys have any questions about the material we've covered today, where we finish out the peripheral nervous system. You guys are free to go and we end the recording.